I'm going to speak to you about Toru Dutt today. She is perhaps the first woman poet in the Indian English tradition. She lived for a very short time, born in 1856, died in 1877. And in that short span of life, she produced some very, very fine poetry and fiction translation from the French and also reinterpretations of the ancient epic stories of India. Her life has some parallels, I think, with that of John Keats, the romantic poet, who also lived a very short life of only 26 years. But in those 26 years, he managed to produce some exquisite poetry. She becomes, in my opinion, a kind of a cultural icon, someone who helps us to understand the modernity of India at a point when India was slowly emerging into what we might call a modern nation state. With the advent of British rule, which of course slowly consolidated itself and became very powerful after the 1857 Sepoy mutiny, what they called the Sepoy mutiny, but which we call the first war of independence, the British began to have, you know, exercise a greater control over the colony. And they introduced English education in the 19th century. You know, the 1835 Indian Education Act, which Lord Macaulay pushed through after writing that very well-known famous minute on Indian education, where he said that you know, one shelf of English literature is equal to all the literature of Asia and, you know, India put together with all its mythological stories and so on. Extraordinarily arrogant statement, but influential. And therefore, the nation at that point was going through an extraordinary churning. And that churning where Indian thinkers begin to imbibe British or Western knowledge is what we call the Bengal Renaissance because much of the action took place in Calcutta at that time. There is a saying that what happens in Calcutta today will happen in the rest of Bengal tomorrow and what happens in Bengal today happens in the rest of India tomorrow. It's no longer true because there are other centers of power in the country but in the 19th century that was very much a fact. Now can someone tell me what who are the great figures whom we, one associates with the Bengal Renaissance? Would you like to answer that question? Vidya Sagar, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, mm. Michael Madhusudan Dutt. Ram Mohan Roy, Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar, Madhusudan Dutt. Anybody else? Can we not put Toru Dutt into that picture too? Because she is a contemporary of these writers. And we can also think of her as part of that Bengal Renaissance. Toru Dutt belonged to a very well-known Kayasta family of Bengal. They were the Dutts of uh, Rambagan. Rambagan is a part of Calcutta. It was an old Hindu Kayasta family, distinguished. The grandfather of Toru Dutt was a man called Rasamoy Dutt. He was a great believer in English education, educated himself, and very, very clearly was an Anglophile. Who is an Anglophile? Someone who loves English ways and English education, the English language, and so on. Torudat's father, that is the fifth son of Rasamoy Dutt, was Govind Chandra Dutt. And he was also a great Anglophile, someone who believed that reading English literature and imbibing British values was the only way forward in a country which was looking backward. You see? So that was a belief in many, many intellectuals in the 19th century in Calcutta at that time, that there was things in Indian culture, particularly Hindu culture, which were extremely reactionary. Remember that it was a time when sati was an important issue, the widow question, the widow remarriage question, the age of consent for children, at what age should a girl, child be married, and things of that kind, child marriages, all these issues came up. And much of this blighted Hindu culture because it was backward looking and feudal and very patriarchal. So many of these Indians who were educated in English 
and who went to good colleges, particularly the college called Hindu College, which was established in 1817. Today, that college is called Presidency College, Calcutta. They were all of the opinion that much of the traditional uh, I mean, beliefs of India were backward looking and needed to be uh, you know, rejected. And English education was a way to move forward. Gobind Chandra Dutt was very clearly of that way of thinking. And he uh, not only educated his children, he had three children. The first one was uh, Abju, was a son, who died very early in 1865. Uh, and the second child was Arudath. Tori was the third. She was the youngest of the children. And all three of them were educated in English. And they were given Western ways of looking at things, dresses and so on. And in fact, in, in the middle of the 1870s, in 1870, they all traveled to France and lived abroad for nearly four years. Between 1870 and 1874, Toru Dutt, and Abju Dutt were studying in France and also in Cambridge University, England. Okay? So this was the uh, belief that if you could imbibe English education, then you would be forward-looking and that that was the way to take India into modernity. And part of the issue of modernization also involved conversion to Christianity. In fact, Gobind Chandra Dutt converted to Christianity in 1862. His wife, Kshetramani, she belonged to another very well-known Hindu family, the Mitar family of Calcutta. But she was an ardent Hindu and it took her a long time to reconcile herself to this act of conversion. But then when she finally was uh, you know, persuaded that the conversion was all right, then she became an ardent Christian and very, very intense in her beliefs. In fact, she even wrote a couple of books and translations which had a Christian you know, bias in them. But Kshetramani's real importance for us is that she inculcated in her children, and particularly Torudat, a great love for the great Indian classics, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the great stories of India. And she used to tell them stories, just like any mother in our traditional homes does. With Abju's death in 1865 and Oru's death in 1874, Toru was left alone. She died three years later in, 18, in 1877. But death and the fear of death and the premonition of death are extremely important motifs in her writing. The very first important publication was during her lifetime, and that was in 1876. It was called A Sheaf Gleaned. From French fields. It's a very nice title, but basic point is that since Thorudath had studied in France, she had picked up French quite well, and she had read, read the French poets and the French writers. And so she translated the French writers into English and produced this volume of literature. And it is said by some discerning observers that if Torudath had not written anything else and if only a sheaf had been published, her reputation would have been secure. That is the great praise given to a sheaf gleaned from French fields. That was in 1876. But you can notice that many of her other works, which I am going to list now, are all published posthumously. She died in 1877. But in 1878, for example, Bianca, her novel, was published. Bianca or the young Spanish maiden. 
this is a kind of a gothic story, romance, gothic, gothic romance, where you have Bianca, who is not English, she is Spanish, and she is very, uh, very alienated in an English context. And so some of the tensions which build up for Bianca, when she has to live with English folk, she marries into an English home and so on. And the way in which she is treated by the English people is part of the uh, you know, motif of the story or the burden of the story. There is of, uh, clearly some autobiographical uh, you know, dimension to this book also. Because after all, Torudat converted to Christianity, her father converted, and immediately in Calcutta society, they were ostracized. Because they came from a very high class Hindu family, a Kayasta family, upper class, upper caste. And yet, conversion of this kind meant that their class position or their former caste position was of no consequence when it came to the social you know, context in which they were living. So they were ostracized and very badly treated. And Toru must have felt particularly offended that you know, the people whom she knew or the people whom, with whom she was supposed to be uh, you know, a part of that larger society was suddenly alienated from her. So I think the Bianca story, to some extent, is a kind of a, a reference to her own you know, sense of alienation in Calcutta society. But it's not just Calcutta society we're talking about. When she goes to England in 1870, France and England, and for four years she lives abroad, she makes friends only with one or two people. But on the whole, she also senses the fact that as a colored woman, Indian origin, she is not fair, she is not white, and she is suddenly seen as the other by the white people in France and England. So even in that country, and where she studied in Cambridge University for a while, uh, there was a sense of being ostracized or being alienated from those surroundings. So I think this idea of alienation becomes an extremely important motive again. The first motive which I talked about was death, if you remember. I'll make my list that here, death alienation. And as we go along, we'll add to this list of important motives and themes. The anguish which Toru felt must have been felt by other people in her family also. And one person who felt it very much was Toru Dutt's cousin, the distinguished economist and civil servant R. C. Dutt, Ramesh Chandra Dutt on whom, incidentally, one of our distinguished colleagues, uh, Professor Meenakshi Mukherjee, who passed away a couple of weeks ago, has written a book. In fact, her book was released the day after she died in, uh, in Delhi. And it's a book about Ramesh Chandra Dutt, an Indian for all seasons. Because Dutt was a great um, uh, translator of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. He was a great economist. He was a man who understood society, he wrote fiction, he wrote poetry, and he has written a very short poem called The Hindu Convert to His Wife, because Ramesh Chandra also became a Christian, like the other Dutts, okay? And in fact, there's a Dutt family ab album, which was published in 1870, where contributions from various branches of the Dutt family were put together. And Ramesh Chandra Dutt, of course, is one of those contributors. But here is a poem which I'll read out for you. It's called The Hindu Convert to His Wife. And it goes like this. Repel me not with scorn. Repel me not with scorn. Like others, will thou turn away and leave me quite forlorn? Repel me not with scorn. Like others, will thou turn away and leave me quite forlorn? Wilt thou too join the scoffing crowd, the cold, the heartless, and the proud, who curse the hallowed morn, when daring idols to disown, I knelt before the Saviour's throne. Idol worship, which is common in Hinduism, particularly Sanatana Hinduism, and Ramesh Chandra Dutt's parents and family must have been worshipping idols, and since it's Calcutta we are talking about, Kali particularly, and Torudat has a statement about the hideous nature of Kali. After she became a convert, she was very critical of Hindu practices. I'll come to that in a moment. But look at this poem. It's a very deeply felt poem. 
And it's a kind of poem which Torudat would have also internalized. And some of it, I think, gets reflected in this novel which we call Bianca. In 1879, a year later, was published another book. It's an English uh, novel, but it's about a French woman. 1879, it's called Le Journal de Mademoiselle Le Arve. This is again another novel, which uh, it's a fragmentary novel. It's not completed. It's also about a French woman and there is of course foregrounded in this kind of uh, fiction the subject position of the woman okay so the woman question remember that in the 19th century uh, there was a great effort at uh, countering what we might call orientalist or western ways of looking at india remember that there were great orientalists like sir william jones at the turn of the 18th century Colebrook, Wilson, a whole lot of them who wrote glowingly about ancient India. But by implication they were saying that modern India or contemporary India was no longer the wonder India was at one time. The wonder that was India, says A. R. Uh, uh, Basham in his book. So this orientalist representation of India as a backward, as a, as a, a nation which had its great moments of glory, but which is now in a state of degeneration and all that, required some kind of a counter. And since colonialism was now a part of India's cultural history, the elite Hindus very often felt that the best way to counter English rule was to tell them that there are some parts of our land, some parts of our consciousness which you can never conquer. The body you have conquered, the external landscape you have conquered. You control our public sphere or our public life, but you cannot control our spiritual life. And that spiritual life is embodied or it is deposited, so to speak, on the shoulders of the women of India. So the women of India are the repositories of culture. They have a tremendous responsibility of having to carry on their frail shoulders the whole weight of Indian tradition. And some of them, of course, sank under the weight of that tradition. But you can see that the male dominated discourse of those times was always trying to tell you that when it comes to the Indian woman, she cannot be violated by British rule because that is a sphere which is private, which is inward, which is essentially India. While the outer part of India, the, the public life, the Babus, the educated Indians who are called Babus, they have to work in government offices. They have got to get up at uh, you know, 5 o'clock and rush to the collector's house. They can be badly humiliated. All that is the public sphere. But there is a private sphere which is essential, pure and which is uh, you know, unviolated. So the emphasis on women was so strong that the other flip side of it is that by making the woman look so you know, important, you were also keeping her in the home and not letting her come out. So opportunities to educate themselves, opportunities to work, all these things were not afforded women. So the patriarchal way of keeping the woman inside the domestic space was also a way of exploiting her and preventing her from having the freedoms which any human being should have. This along with, you know, widow remarriages and I mean, uh, the, uh, the opposition to widow remarriage, the, you know, uh, uh, getting children married at a very young age, giving the uh, women, children no uh, agency in their lives, etc. is all part of this larger idea of making the nation a feminine construct. Okay. So, Torudat is reacting to this sort of thing also. And many of her novels and poems are also about the woman and her position in society. When she came back to India in, 19, in 1874, some transformation took place. She had left India disgusted with Hindu society, which had alienated them. She went to England and France and came back after four years thoroughly disillusioned with the British 
partly because she felt that her color and her ethnicity were being called into question, ethnicity. So this feeling that they were being in a way kept aside, kept apart was rankling in Toru Dutz's mind. When she came back to India, one of the things she did with her father was to go back to Sanskrit. She was English educated and now she was going to pour over the Sanskrit texts and learn the Sanskrit language and understand and imbibe the great values of our great epics, the Ramayana, Mahabharata, the great stories of India and so on. But there is one important point here. Even though she was going back to her Hindu heritage, her Christianity always got in the way of her total acceptance of the Hindu values. So when she is going back to tradition, she is recovering tradition but also reinventing tradition. Okay? That is an important part of her purpose. So she is not writing these epics or versions of these epics simply because she wants to translate. There is an, of course an attempt at translation, but the translation is meant also to interrogate our past. You will see this happening in several places. For example, in that uh, well-known poem called The Royal Ascetic and the Hind. Hind is of course a deer, right? The Royal Ascetic and the Hind. We are talking about the great King Bharata, who was the son of Shakuntala. If you remember the myths, you will know that. The Royal Ascetic and the hind. It's a story of a great king who renounces the world and becomes an ascetic. So no attachment whatsoever to human beings and to things, property and all that sort of stuff. Then one fine day he notices a small deer, a small fawn helplessly moving about here and he goes and rescues the fawn and suddenly he becomes very attached to the fawn. Okay? And Thorudath is playing on this idea of attachment and detachment. Remember one of the great sayings of the Bhagavad Gita is detached action. You got to be detached in this world. You must live in this world but not be of it. You should not allow the world to get the better of you. You should be able to act because you have to act. You got to perform your duties but you must do it in a spirit of detachment. It's this ascetic ideal which Torudath is questioning in the ascetic king and the hind. And her point is that Real spirituality can come not through renunciation but through acceptance of the world and by becoming engaged with the world. The same idea comes up in another poem called Yogadhyam Uma. Uma, Uma is of course the wife of Shiva but she has, uh, she calls her Yogadhya that is one who has become a yogi. And what is the important thing about Uma? It is that she is a woman who is capable of giving much more than most other people are. And she's attached to people. And it is through this constant giving, constant affection for people and this, this worldliness, this ability to live in the world and be part of the world and accept the world as your own, which is her real strength, not asceticism, not renunciation. Take another poem like the Pativrata ideal of Sita. When she deals with the Sita story, Lakshmana, there's a poem of hers called Lakshman, the Lakshman Rekha which Lakshmana draws when you know, he goes in search of Rama because Sita sends him away. Remember that whole scene? Now Sita is an ideal of you know, womanly chastity, of pativrata or you know, devotion to the husband and of withdrawal from active life. But the way Torudat treats of her in her own version of the Ramayana is that Sita is a woman with great you know, uh, ambitions and great uh, capacity for action. And when she wants something, she gets it done. Even though she may be quiet and, you know, modest and chaste and, you know, subdued, she knows exactly how she can get her way. She makes Lakshman do what she wants from him. She makes Rama go after the fawn. And so that, that part of Sita's character is what Torudat is more interested in rather than the Pativrata attitude. Similarly, in the case of Savitri, who... Uh, you know, if you remember, has a debate with Yama, the god of death, and she manages to recover her husband Satyavan. She does it by tricking Yama. She tricks her uh, husband's parents also into accepting her desire or her wish to go after her husband. Because normally a woman wouldn't go out, but she takes her parents' permission, but tells them the reasons why she wants to do this. They are convinced, 
she goes out in search of her husband, encounters Yama, tricks him into giving her a boon, which would ultimately mean that he has to restore Satyavan to her. So, this capacity of a woman to rise to the occasion and to employ tricks if necessary in order to get his her way is something which Thorudath is extremely happy about. There is another little story of a Dalit character called Buttu in the Ramayana. We have stories in the, in the various epics where we also have people from so called lower castes and the way they are you know treated. In the case of Buttu, the uh, uh, Torudat emphasis is on caste and the destruction of caste. So, you can see that at various levels, she is promoting what we might call progressive, modern ideals. She is not given up her Hindu culture, but she also accepts the fact that some of those values in the Hindu fold are absolutely outdated and antediluvian and therefore, Christianity may be one way of balancing some of the feudal elements in our culture. So, this is something which I would like you to keep in mind. She is obviously what Homi Baba, the well known post colonial critic has called an in between kind of person, neither here nor there, but he does not see this as a, as a fault or as a negative thing. This in betweenness, hybridity is something which Homi Baba thinks is a matter for celebration, because that is the condition of post modern living, of post colonial living. We are not pure in any way, we are always mixed up, we are always living in different worlds and therefore, there is a mix, there is a fusion and there is hybridity. You will find this happening poem like Bagmari. Bagmari is a place in Calcutta, which is where these people used to retreat, it was their home. Because they were ostracized by Calcutta society, they went back to their own home and lived in that home as comfortably as possible. They had a casualty in a tree there and then uh, uh, Torudat talks of the casualty in a tree, but always talks of the tree as though she is seeing it in the lake districts in England. Keats and Wordsworth and their language is what helps her to understand the casual in a tree of her own childhood and of her Bagmari residence. In a wonderful last, uh, uh, last example, which I want to give is the poem called the Lotus. It is a wonderful poem, where the lily and the rose are in contention as to which is the more beautiful flower or which is the more influential flower. And they all go to love and ask her, what is the you know, uh, flower which is better? Some people say a lily because it is white and tall, some others say the rose which is pink and beautiful and then the, uh, uh, the flower factions fight a great battle and finally, they settle on the lotus because the lotus has the qualities of the rose and the qualities of the lily. Okay? And, but the point to note here is that Torudath is talking about a flower which is indigenously Indian. While the rose is partly Indian and partly European, the lily is to a large extent associated with European culture. And the lily and rose battle has been fought in English literature for a long, long, long time. So, it is not the first time. But in Torudat's poem, the lotus becomes the symbol of what we might call hybridity between cultures. Let us mix the cultures. Let us not be uh, essentially Indian or essentially European. Let us try to mix and let us have a fusion of cultures. This is what Toru that seems to be saying. But there is also another angle when you know that the lotus is always you know growing in slime and dirty water. It never gets dirty itself even though it is in dirt. And this is I think a symbol of how human beings should live in the world, the Bhagavad Gita ideal that you should live in the world, but not get affected by it. You should be detached from it. To some extent, Torudath is also bringing in that dimension of what we might call the Hindu value system of detachment. But on the whole, I would read this little sonnet, which I will read out for you very quickly for you as a kind of a concluding you know, a gambit. It is a poem about hybridity. It is a poem about uh, attacking essentialisms, if you like. It is a poem about fusion of culture. Love came to Flora asking for a flower that would of flowers be undisputed queen. The lily and the rose long, long had been rivals for that high honour. Bards of power had sung their claims. The rose can never tower like the pale lily with her Juno mien. But is the lily lovelier? Thus 
between flower factions rang the strife in Psyche's bar. Give me a flower delicious as the rose and stately as the lily in her pride. But of what color? Rose red, love first chose. Then prayed, no, lily white, or both provide. And Flora gave the lotus, rose red dyed and lily white, the queenliest flower that blows. Thank you very much.